but that notwithstanding, I think it is in order to recognize His Excellency, the former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, who has occasioned this event to happen. Your Excellency, I salute you, as I do salute your wife, Madam Patience. Permit me also to recognize uh, the former president of Sierra Leone, His Excellency, Dr. Ernest Koroma, as I also appreciate the former Vice President of the Gambia and the Chair of the ECOWAS Commission, and of course, the Governor of Bielsa, under whose feet we are eating metaphorically. And of course, his wife and the governors from different states of Nigeria the royal fathers, and as is wise in every occasion, and this is common, whenever a men are in present of their wife, they say, my good wife, who is present in this assembly. <laughs> I also want to appreciate a Nigerian friend who, while out of this country, said he must be here, and is here Dr. Linus Okorie, who flew all the way from the United States of America to be with me here. We are gathered here to talk about democracy. I'm very slow to use that word in the recent past, because who defines democracy? What is it? Is it about the periodic meetings or elections that we hold every so often? Is it equal to governance? Who defines democracy? Many years ago, a great African-American, John Henry Clark, who is a great Pan-Africanist, observing the many African countries that were regaining independence said that when African countries regained independence, all of them inherited systems of government that were inherited from their former colonizers. And he went on to say, and none of them will ever succeed on the basis of those inherited governance systems. There is a sense in which those words now ring true. We are in a continent that is today divided into 54 countries out of a scheme which was hatched by European powers in 1884 and 1885 when they sat in Berlin to divide the continent of Africa into spheres of influence, into hunting grounds. The British had their hunting ground, the French did, the Belgians did, the Italians did, the Germans did, the Portuguese did. Then, of course, we resisted them, and they appeared to leave, and we celebrated. But the question is, did they leave? And if they leave, if they, le they left the continent in which they lived, and still are leaving, what impact did they have? Is the impact still with us? Have we liberated ourselves? 
And why did we drive them away? I can still remember those words that I listen to every so often, spoken on the sixth day of March, 1957, by Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah, that the independence of Ghana means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. I can still remember him saying that we are regaining independence, that we may govern ourselves, that we may harness our resources, that we may have education that is in the best interest of our people, that we may take control of our cocoa and coffee and yams. The question this afternoon, have we? The question is, after all the countries regained independence and we started electing our leaders, did they change? Did they husband our resources in a better way? I can still remember in 1958 when the same Kwame Nkrumah invites leaders in Accra, Ghana in 1958 and tells them, that we are not truly free. There is another project that has inherited colonialism. It is neo-colonialism. And I can remember him moving two years later in Casablanca, Morocco, and telling his audience, this independence that we think we have regained, we will lose it. We will lose it because the neo-colonizer has not left he is with us and he is using some of us and he is the enemy from within that we must be wary of. And he did not stop there. Three years later, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, 32 African countries are now independent. Each one of them, heads of state, talking about Africa, about African unity, about the need to have one army, about the need to have one government, about the need to have one currency, about the need to have a common unified foreign policy, but they listened to him not. And we had a weak organization called the OAU, which made its contribution, participated in the liberation of other African countries. But the question is, is Africa the richer because we regained independence? You will remember that even as we regained independence, the other countries still remained here. And it's only in the 1980s that we see other African countries regaining their independence. You'll remember the wars of independence in Angola. You'll remember the wars of independence in Mozambique. You'll remember the wars of independence in Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde. And you'll remember the last bastion of man's inhumanity to man in South Africa in 1984, preceded only by liberation from the regime in what is now Zimbabwe. The question is, the promises that our founding fathers made to us, have we fulfilled them as we talk about democracy and constitutions? Who brought the constitutions to us? Which constitutions do our traditional rulers operate from? Are they written? For whose interests are they written? As I talk about democracy and development now, I want you to cast your eyes across the continent of Africa now. Look at young people dying as they leave the coast of Senegal. When you tell them about democracy and elections, are you talking to them when they are dying? When they are dying in the Mediterranean, 
Are you talking to them? If you go into a room where there are 10 young Africans, eight of them want to run away from the continent of Africa, even in countries where there are so-called constitutional governments. This is the Africa that we are talking about today. When you go to Australia, Europe, and America, young Africans are being humiliated. If you doubted it, you only saw what happened in Ukraine when the war broke out. See how Africans were being humiliated. The question that we are asking today and the question that is alive and well today and the debate that we ought to wrap our minds around today is what is democracy? Whose democracy? Is there a possibility that we who are gathered here today, as Carter G. Woodson said in 1933, we are so thoroughly miseducated that in fact, even when we think we are getting it right, we are getting it wrong? Is it a possibility that one of the things that we must do in assemblies such as this and at all times is to unlearn some of the indoctrination to which we have been subjected so that we may learn things that can help the continent of Africa? How is it that every time we think that we have diagnosed the disease properly and that we have a new antidote, when we apply that antidote, a new wound appears, how is it? How is it? that when we regained independence in 1960, it started with coup d'etats, and as we speak now, we have coup d'etats. If our memories are not serving as well, don't you remember that no sooner had Congo regained independence in 1961 than there was a coup d'etat and Patrice Emery Lumumba was killed? If you doubt me, is it not the case that in 1963 in Togo they killed Silvanus Olympia? If you doubt me, is it not the truth that in 1966 they overthrew Kwame Nkrumah? Is it not the truth that in this country they took away the government of Namdi Azikiwa and Abubakar Tafawa Balewa in 1967? Is it not true that they eliminated Modibo Keita in Mali? that they took away Hamed Ben Bella in Algeria. So our story is, as the French would say, plus a change, plus la même change. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And if that is the case, we must ask ourselves uncomfortable questions which will give us uncomfortable answers. Many times we don't want to ask those uncomfortable questions because we know the answers and we do not want to hear the answers. And we are assembled here to remind ourselves that the reason why we lament about Africa is that it appears that the systems of governance that we inherited and that we have been deploying for our benefit continue to put us at the foot of the ladder. We do not complain because there have been no changes and improvement in our circumstances. In certain cases, they have been. But as Uganda, as Yoweri Museveni says, and I agree with him, what is the point of fighting as to who is taller than the other when you are all dwarfs? <laughs> this is the space in which Africa finds herself. So that the state of California in the United States of America has a GDP bigger than all the countries of Africa combined. This is undesirable. It is undesirable that a country which is great in prospect, for example, like Nigeria, with a population of 250 million, generates less power than Costa Rica, which 
has a population of 5 million and generates three times more power than Nigeria is undesirable. This is what we are talking about. We are talking about countries which have GDPs, which ought not to be the GDP that they have. And we are saying that this must be because of the systems of governance that we have. I heard His Royal Majesty so very keenly and I agree with him. What must we do? What is the nexus between good governance and development? And what is development? I remember Julius Kambaraha saying in 1966, that when they come and tell us that development are roads and the airports, we agree with them. But that is not the end of development. The, end, the beginning and the end of development is human resources, Mwalimu said. Mwalimu said, and I agree with him, you can build roads and destroy roads. You can build the airports and rebuild the airports. But when you build human beings intergenerationally, the airports that you destroy come out of their minds. So we must also redefine what development is. We have seen countries where edifices were christened to constitute development and they were destroyed in the twinkling of an eye. But the human spirit is resilient and is constantly seeking liberation. The human spirit is constantly yearning for something to fulfill it. And that something is what sometimes we refer to as the social contract. That no man or no group of men who have arrogated to themselves the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom must never ever assume that they are God's gift to man, to govern and rule them as they will. That is the duty of men willingly to surrender their will to men that they may govern them. So the next thing that we must interrogate in Africa is who is the leader? Because we have too many individuals in Africa occupying offices who are not leaders, they are merely misleaders. And the time is now, therefore, to ask ourselves, and I can still remember you are now immortal words, Honorable and Excellency President in 2015, when you said so very ably that your ambition was not worth the blood of the people of Nigeria. When you spoke those words, I do not know what came to your mind, but you must have received a sudden enlightenment because those words underlined the fact that men must know when to stop. And the appropriate time you stop. And Nigeria was the richer because you stopped. We live in a continent today where every election is a harbinger for chaos. But you said, let it go. We have a saying in Kiswahili, he who does not want to be defeated is not a contestant. Today, when we talk about leadership, we are talking about people to recognize that it is not a cutthroat competition. Unfortunately, in Africa, leadership and the quest for it is a cutthroat competition where throats are actually cut. So we must also, in addition to define democracy and governance and leadership, ask ourselves, 
Who is the leader? You know, many years ago as a young man, I watched a movie, which movie has stuck in my mind. It was in 1982. And I went to the theaters and I went with a notebook. And the movie was Gandhi by Sir Richard Attenborough. And at that time, Mahatma Gandhi or Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi had been invited back from South Africa by one of the great Indian nationalists, Professor Gokhale. And when he was invited to speak, this is what he said. I have nothing to say, but today as I see you here, the people who are assembled here are businessmen and lawyers from Delhi. You are pretending to speak to India and for India, this is not India. India is out there in the villages, in the hamlets. This is not Nigeria. Nigeria is out there in the municipalities. This is not Africa. Africa is out there in Bangi, in Nwakchat, in Khartoum where they are fighting, in Pirda. Africa is out there in Niamey. Africa is out there in Ouagadougou. Africa is out there in Bamako, in the slums of Bamako. When we speak here in English, do we reach them? When we speak in French, do we reach them? When we speak in Portuguese, do we reach them? What is the Yoruba word for democracy? What is the Ijo word for democracy? What is the Ibibio word for democracy? What is the Ibo, Ibo word for democracy? Give me that word. When you give me that word, then we are beginning a conversation. Because that conversation is the conversation that is going to tell us how we have a symbiotic relationship between democracy and the thing that we call development. You know, this mother continent, this continent that remains in the stage in which it remains, is a continent that continues to suffer even because of external factors. But we have blamed the others for too long. We must begin to blame ourselves. Oh, we have blamed the British and they deserve to be blamed. When we belong to the Commonwealth and we call our ambassadors high commissioners, we deserve to blame them because our political true north appears to be the United Kingdom. That's where when we have our presidents and they want to contest elections in Africa, they go to Chatham so that their masters can listen to them and say, it's okay. So we can blame the British and they deserve to be blamed. We deserve to blame the French. Because before you are elected into one of their countries, you've got to go to Paris, and they've got to say, c'est la vie. Then they say, très bien. And then we know that you come back home and you are simply a manager of a plantation. And if you had any doubt about that, just see what is happening in Niger when the French president says, I will not remove my ambassador. And Africa says nothing about it. And even when they say anything about it, they say it mutedly and they sanitize their language lest they annoy Paris. And the same happens in Portugal. The same happens with the Belgians. I look forward to an Africa where things are done in the continent of Africa. And this continent of Africa has tried and there is no shortage of individuals who have tried to link democracy and development. In our midst, we have leaders. We have the former pre two former presidents here who served well. I've said this before, no matter how good a dancer you are, you must know when to leave the stage. 
There are too many dancers in Africa who think I'm only, I'm the only dancer in town. And until God calls me, I'm not leaving the stage. Such dancers will be removed by men. And that is how I explained the coup d'etat that are coming here in 1964, talking about the military interventions in civilian government. This is what Kwame Nkrumah said. The military have no business interfering with civilian governments. But if civilian governments misbehave, it may become necessary for a short period to disrupt their agenda so that they can midwife a new dispensation. It is in this context that we must understand the military interventions. But remember that true democracy requires and demands the eternal vigilance of the people because Africa has also seen a situation where military leaders remove their uniform and adorn suits and lo and behold, like Paul and Saul, they become civilians themselves. And therefore, it is important even as we celebrate these military coups to remind ourselves that they are merely midwives. And midwives are neither the father, nor the mother, nor the child. Their duty is to ensure that all the three are happy. And we, the population, must be eternally vigilant. And that is why, therefore, when we talk about democracy, we must ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? And we must also ask the question, are coup d'etats only mounted by men and women in uniform? No. I've seen coups mounted by judiciaries in Africa. I've seen coups being mounted by the political class in Africa. When people engage in sophistry in interpreting constitution, those are also coup d'etats. And I would want us, therefore, as we talk about strengthening democracy, we must also talk about strengthening institutions. Whether it is in Kenya, whether it is in Zimbabwe, whether it is in Nigeria, whether it is in Ghana, we must have a culture of respecting institution. Sometimes in Africa, we behave as if institutions work on their own motion. No. Institutions are as strong as the men and women who occupy them. If you have wrong men and wrong women in office, no matter how strong the institution you claim to be strong, it will not perform because the history of nature is one, garbage in, garbage out. And if that is the case, therefore, we who are gathered here and talking about governance, this is serious business. What we are talking about here is serious business. I want you to look at Africa now with me in Sudan, in Khartoum. Because of bad governance and absence of democracy, no schooling going on in Khartoum. If you are a university professor, no university to lecture at. There is no agriculture going on there. There are no health services going on there in Khartoum. The thing that they built, they are destroying. It will take generations to rebuild Sudan. We are talking about development. In the health sector, all the children that ought to have been vaccinated will not be vaccinated, which means that all the diseases that, that we had conquered will come back again so that the health burden will be that heavy. No food is being planted so that we'll once again be importing rice and wheat from Ukraine, which is at war. Look at the Sahel now. Mali is de facto divided into two, no agriculture going on. So that 
you will be importing chicken from Brazil, chicken from Brazil, chicken. No agriculture. I'm talking about development, brothers and sisters. If you are sick because there is no research going on in our universities, no research. We receive medicine from India, from China, and we take the medicine by faith because we do not know what they contain. Our bureaus of standardization have no standards for these things. And if you doubt me, only recently we had syrup imported from India. How many children did it kill in the Gambia? We have no standardization. So we are talking about serious business in Africa. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, the eastern part of it, over 120 armed groups. The busiest airspace in the continent of Africa. The rest of the world is taking our resources. There is a new scramble for Africa. Today, Africa is a theater for other worlds. If the British have gone and they have not gone, if the French have gone and they have not gone, if the Portuguese have gone and they have not gone, if the Belgians have gone and they have not gone, Chinese are also here. They are here. Building roads, building stadia. The Turks are here. The Qataris are here. The Russians are here. And yet Africans somehow believe that when we remove one slave master and we bring another slave master, then it's better. So we hear Africans praising Wagner in Russia. African intellectuals, I think the president of ECHO has called them pseudo-intellectuals. An appropriate and heavy English word. The question therefore is what must we do? Because there is a neo-colonial project and there is a new scramble for Africa. And Africa is moving from pillar to post, passing declaration after declaration. Africans are good at passing declarations. The Lagos Plan of Action of 1980. To develop Africa, did we fulfill it? No. The Yamasukuru Declaration on Free Airspace 1988, have we fulfilled it? No. The Abuja Declaration of 2001 to spend at least 15% of our budget in health, in health. Did we fulfill it? No. The Malabo Declaration on, against terrorism and unconstitutional changes of government. Have we fulfilled it? It is as if it was steroid to tell others now that they don't want it. Let's have it. Malabo. The Maputo Declaration on the rights of women and all these. Have we fulfilled them? The time is now that Africa should stop attending meetings. We should only have periodic meetings to ask ourselves how effectively have we implemented the declaration that we made. Because we are talking about governance. Otherwise, Africa is being tossed from pillar to post. I'm still talking about democracy and development. And you know, Africa is toes like yo-yo. Their leaders are invited to the G7. Once the photo is taken, then they go. Recently, we were invited to something called the G20. And then we celebrated, then we go. Then we are invited to the BRICS. Then we celebrate, then we go. Then we'll be invited to the G77. Then we go. We are in the business of being invited to meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, one can go on and on, but I want to pose a number of questions as I bring my submission to the close. This continent of Africa, 
This continent that is divided into 54 countries, is it not the time now that we must examine what constitutes democracy? Is there something in our traditional governance systems that we can take and help how we govern? Is there something like that? This is a question that I want us to consider. Is there a possibility that the elections we hold that we do not understand are the actual disruptors of our democracy in Africa? That we spend so much time in them and that the only thing that lacks in African government is actually trust? Do we trust each other in Africa? I want to pose, where does Nigeria print her ballots? Is it in Nigeria? The answer is no. Does Kenya print her ballots in Kenya? No. Does Zimbabwe print her ballots in Zimbabwe? No. This is part of the problem. Trust. The third thing that we ask ourselves, do we prepare our leaders or young people to take over leadership in an environment that is understood by the population, or we think that leadership is something that is God-given to us and must never surrender? The question is, can we learn from others? Can we learn from others and implement creatively? The fourth thing that we must ask ourselves, what can we do to create an environment where our resources are deployed in a manner that is understood by the society? These are the questions that I think ought to be alive in our minds. And I want to conclude with this in 1997, the sixth day of March. The president of Tanzania, Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere, was invited as a guest of honor on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Ghana's independence, and this is what he said. He said, several years ago, Kwame Nkrumah told us to unite. We refused to unite. We did not want unity because we thought that unity would solve all our problems, no. But we knew that if we are united, then the world will begin to respect us. Because the world does not recognize our Tanzanianness or Ghanaianness or Nigerianness, the world only sees us as Africans. And the day we begin to make serious contributions in agriculture, in the science, in the arts, and in all other spheres of development, that is the day that the world will stop and begin to respect us. I commend to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we give meaning to those words of Kambarage Nyerere. He went on, that our generation had a divine duty to liberate the continent of Africa from the yoke of colonialism. In the process of doing so, we made many mistakes, but who among us is without error? You, the generation that now exists today, it is your duty to lift Africa from another to another pedestal. And you can only lift the continent by doing certain things that are required of you. It will be tiring, it will be painful, but of all the sins that we have committed, there is one mistake that we must never commit, the mistake of giving up. I'm urging you today, we must never give up. And I see Africa today, we have tried many things, Africa Agenda 2063, Africa Continental Free Trade Area, all these are efforts that are being made and they can only happen in an environment where there is peace and tranquility. We promised ourselves that we would silence the guns in the year 2020, the guns are louder now. So as we are committing ourselves to this reality, I'm submitting to us that the continent of Africa has the ability we have the human resource, which is the greatest of all resources. We have the natural resources, which can be harnessed through natural resources. We have men and women who can govern us. We have young men and women who are impatient. And if we are not very careful, this continent, which is great in prospect, will not realize our potential. The time is now. 
The time therefore is now. You leaders who are here, when you are seeking office, seek office that you may be servant leaders. The time is now. Those young men who are here who allow themselves to be used as cannon fodder by individuals who seek public office on the basis of ill-gotten wealth, the time is now to reject their money. The time is now for Africans, wherever they are, to remember that development will never come unless we have good, good governance. The time is now that African and African institutions must not receive instructions from institutions outside of the continent. The time is now that we Africans must exercise the ghost of low self-esteem. The time is now that we Africans must not think that we are only good when we receive a seal of approval from heads of states of other countries. The time is now for Nigeria particularly to rise to the occasion. One in every five black men in the world is Nigeria. Don't let us down. Rise up and lead the continent. God bless you. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Professor Patrick Lumumba. He was billed to speak for 30 minutes.